Good morning, everybody. Um, and I don't, you know, I don't want to contradict Lynn and create controversy so early in the morning, but I saw some of that dancing last night. I, I'm not so sure. I'm not so sure. Um, no, you're all great. I love the way you move. You got a lot of rhythm out there. Uh, so uh, I, I have uh, a couple of jobs this morning. Uh, the first is to recognize our uh, NAXA board members and National Advisory Board members, and then second to introduce the moderator of our first panel. Um, so let me just jump right in. Uh, as those of you who were at the membership uh, meeting uh, or luncheon yesterday know, the board met yesterday as part of its uh, annual meeting process and uh, elected three new board members, uh, although actually, in fact, what we did was re-elect three board members to, um, to extend their terms. And we were very fortunate um, uh, this year in that we had three board members who had been recently appointed to fill uh, midterm vacancies that had emerged over the last uh, year or two. Um, and that gave us a uh, sort of an extended period to, uh, to evaluate one another. Uh, and the good news is that from the board's perspective, we were thrilled to have these three new board members join us and uh, equally thrilled to have the opportunity to reelect them. And even more important, they apparently thought it was good enough, good enough experience that they wanted to stand for reelection. Um, and so yesterday we uh, reelected to full three-year terms Lisa Keegan, the founder of the Education Breakthrough Network and former Arizona Superintendent of Public Ed Instruction, Steve Canavero, the Director of Nevada Public Charter School Authority, and Hannah Scandera, the New Mexico Secretary of Education. Uh, I know Lisa is here. I haven't seen Steve this morning. Is Steve here? But let's have a round of applause for Lisa and all of them. Are you here, Steve? No? There he is. Um, I also want to recognize other board members who are here. Uh, I think they're, I'm not sure if they're all here. I know Joe Baker is here. Joe is right here. Is our, uh, our honorary host, Alan Coverstone, still with us this morning? Alan? No? Uh, and, and Rick Hess. And I don't know if Rick is here. Rick was probably both dancing and out late last night, so he may still be sleeping in. Um, uh, not with us are Kariga Rausch and Garth Harries, um, who are also board members, and I just want to acknowledge that this is a tremendous board. Every member is not only deeply experienced in the work of authorizers, but also in the broader work of education reform, and are all active and high-impact members of this organization, and we, should all, we, all, we all owe them a debt of gratitude. Um, we also have uh, uh, an, an organization or a, a board, an advisory board, national advisory board, it's called, that uh, gets together with the board periodically, works with uh, Greg and the board offline in order to help uh, develop our, uh, our work, our strategy, to provide us feedback on how we're doing and to give us some outside perspective, um, but also sort of um, in close advice on how to get better. Um, and there are a number of National Advisory Board members who I have seen over the last 24 hours or so, and I'm just going to name them. Some of them may be here. I know some of them have already left. Uh, Jim Griffin, Kevin Hall, Robin Lake, James Merriman, Scott Pearson, Nina Reese, Jed Wallace, and Terrence Patterson. Uh, hopefully I haven't left anyone out who might be here, but let's give them a round of applause as well. So our uh, plenary session this morning is a compelling story about school closure in St. Louis. And uh, we're going to have a panel come up in a moment that will uh, both give us some insight into that tough decision um, and also to begin exploring in a pretty concrete way some of the issues, uh, many of which are both extremely challenging and some of which were resolved well, others maybe less so, about trying to mitigate the, uh, the dislocation that's caused by such school closures. I think it's gonna be a really valuable um, session for all of us, a great follow-on to much of the conversation that was going on yesterday, both up here and in the breakout sessions. Um, this session is gonna be moderated by Mache Ashton, who is the CEO of the Newark Charter School Fund and the uh, recent chair of the National Alliance for Public Charter Schools, uh, among other things. Um, and uh, I've had the sort of great professional privilege and joy of spending a lot of time with Michelle over the last year. I don't know if she would say the same. Um, 
But uh, she is spending full time in Newark. I'm spending part time there. Uh, it's both very challenging but very rewarding work. And she is, without question, the person on the point for the charter sector um, in Newark. And I can tell you uh, from firsthand experience that no one believes more and no one is more fully committed to the role that charter schools can play in closing the achievement gap and in transforming public education for all children. And no one works harder than Michelle in making that belief a reality. Michelle Ashton. I have asked the team to come up in the spirit of Memphis, the March of the Ducks. We figured we could all just come up together instead of uh, taking extra time. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, Jim, thanks for the warm remarks. I would absolutely agree that uh, it's been uh, great to get to know you professionally over these last two years. Jim and I play a role of good cop, bad cop, Batman Robin, um, just trying to make things happen in Newark. And so thank you for those warm remarks. Um, we are um, incredibly excited to, to share the St. Louis story today. But I, I must uh, tell you just a little bit of story. I'm um, in Newark, as Jim and I, Jim mentioned, we are really working to um, make sure that there's a prominent role for charter schools in Newark in closing the achievement gap. And just this morning, we, um, I got an email from one of the key stakeholders. We had made a commitment that, all, um, that there should be a commitment to closing all failing schools in Newark, both charter and traditional public school traditional public schools, and I got an email this morning saying, could you just soften that language to say that closing failing schools, that we should can only when necessary, or only when the conditions are right. And my email response back this morning was, well, look, um, charter schools, we hold ourselves to a higher standard. Kids don't have time for us to wait for the conditions to get right or for, for the adults to figure it out. So as Jim said, I am very passionate about the fact that charter schools must be closed if they are failing. But today, you're going to hear the story of how it can be done right with the support and leadership um, of the folks here on this panel. Um, we have to hold ourselves to a higher standard. We have the autonomy. We have the flexibility. And I don't think we got into this to have a, well, if the conditions are right conversation. So with that, I am going to ask each of our panelists to introduce themselves and the role that they have played. Um, today, we're, this first hour is really about getting um, a taste of what's happened uh, in St. Louis over the last uh, couple years. There will be a, a follow-up plenary session where we will go into much more details um, and you'll hear from the panelists about some of the real conversations that have happened. Um, we will also spend time about 15 minutes towards the end of the session to answer any questions the audience has. So please, uh, there'll be folks with microphones around. Please hold your questions to the end and we'll, we'll definitely make sure there's time for that. And last, there is a, a guide around closing failing schools that was, I think, shared yesterday. I understand there's not got, there's, there isn't any guides that are left, um, but they are available on the website. Um, and if you want a copy, I know Cordy said that she will collect your business cards and make sure that you get them. But um, that document that NAXA produces, as always, over the last several years is just a phenomenal resource for all of us. And I think um, in addition to the panelists here, the guide and, and the staff and team in NAXA will be a tremendous resource. Um, with that, we're going to jump right into it, and I'm going to, I think, start at this end and have uh, Robin, which you would just introduce yourself um, and tell a little bit about your role in the St. Louis story. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for having us here. My name is Robin Lobby. I'm the Deputy Chief of Staff. Am I, am I on? I think so. Can you guys hear? Can you hear? No. No, no. Does that help? Yes. There we go. go. On is good. Do we? Good morning again. I'm Robin Wabi. I'm the Deputy Chief of Staff to Mayor Francis Slay in St. Louis. Uh, about 80% of my portfolio is on education and children's <laughs> policy. In 2007, Mayor Slay launched an initiative in St. Louis to attract uh, quality charter schools to St. Louis. Um, we do not have the authority to authorize. Um, we have no real legal authority over any public school issues in the city, but everything we're trying to do, reduce crime, increase jobs, uh, attract people, retain people in our city is all linked to whether or not there's access to high quality schools in our city. So the mayor's very passionate about education and we believe that charter schools, um, high quality charter schools in our, ci in our city are going to be um, an important part of the uh, educational landscape in St. Louis for years to come. And so that, that 
emphasis on quality, which I'll say like 15 times this morning, <laughs> is really been uh, paramount, paramount to the work that we're doing and I think will be reflected in what the mayor and our office accomplished over uh, the last few years when it comes to school closure. Great, Doug. Good morning, everybody. My name is Doug Thayman. I'm the executive director of Missouri Charter Public School Association. Uh, actually, I had joined the association just at the time that this was one of the first pieces that we were really looking at, uh, which was an interesting time to, to join a state association, a membership organization for charter schools. Um, we were in an interesting space with uh, being a state association that represents charter schools but has a greater emphasis on not just whether it's a charter school or not, but on quality and making sure that if we were going to have schools open, uh, that, that these were schools of quality, that these are schools of quality. And so one of the first things we took a look at was we had a real crisis of quality happening in St. Louis. Uh, with the charter schools, and that was something we really needed to take a look at. Uh, we're going to talk more about that this morning and how that led to this closure, uh, this large closure, 3,800 students. Uh, some things that, that just want to throw out for the group. One is uh, we've all said if we can do this, we know you guys can do this mm -hmm. when it's necessary, that this is something that uh, was not easy and there were points where we all felt like this was pretty scary stuff. Uh, but it was important to do. Uh, the other thing that, that's so important in this, of course, is keeping a focus on this is kids' lives. Uh, this isn't just about dollars. This isn't just about uh, buildings and facilities and management companies. This was about the lives of, of children who already were so severely uh, behind in their education and we couldn't afford another day for them to be in these schools, uh, losing, losing more and more time. Um, and the other thing is, when we talk about this, they're, they're, we don't want people to perceive that this is something we're really happy about, like this was just a fun thing to do. Uh, it was definitely not. I think we're all just a little relieved right now uh, that we've worked through so much of this. But uh, just some points that, that I wanted to throw out there for everybody. Great. Thanks, Doug. Gwen? Good morning. My name is Gwen Westbrooks, and I really had nothing to do in my career with charter schools. So how did I get involved in this? Well, uh, I had been a career educator for over 30 years, was very comfortably retired, and then all of a sudden I got a phone call from the Commissioner of Education in Missouri saying, I need your help. <laughs> Uh, little did I know what this was all about then, <laughs> and the journey was kind of wild, tumultuous, but in the end, very successful. Uh, we had a lot of people and a lot of groups working together to make sure that the journey did end up being successful. My job, basically, my title was transition coordinator. Um, because the State Department is in Jeff City and the closures of six schools, six charter schools, was taking place in St. Louis, there was really a need for somebody to be there who could respond immediately to any kind of situations and, and also constantly be monitoring and coordinating all the things that need to be done throughout the, the closures. Um, my job basically, succinctly, was to make sure, the most important part of my job was to make sure that the 3,500 students and the over 400 staff who was displaced by these closures uh, found other schools to attend, hopefully better schools to attend, and found new jobs for teachers and staff. Great, thanks. Deborah. Good morning, everyone. I'm Deborah Carr, and I'm the director of our MU Office of Charter School Operations at the University of Missouri in Columbia. We are a relatively new sponsoring entity in the state of Missouri, 
We've only been in existence since 2007 when we were asked to serve as the sponsor for the Imagine Renaissance Academy of Environmental Science and Math in Kansas City. Echoing what Doug just said earlier, our office has been comprised of 1.5 FTE. Currently, we only have six schools in our portfolio. So we're a very, very small, small entity. And we were working at the same time that this was happening in St. Louis. We were working with a closure with the school on the Kansas City side. So our involvement with what happened in St. Louis was basically threefold. In January of the year that all this happened, we were asked to, to present our closure guide materials to the State Department in Missouri. In March, same year, this is this act this year, we were asked to give all of our letters, all of our materials, all of our FAQs, how we set up websites, all of those things we were asked to uh, deliver to the State Department in March prior to when all of this happened. Secondly, we were also asked if we would take on the sponsorship of a school that was going to be displaced in St. Louis because of the closure. And we agreed to do that if it was necessary. And then thirdly, we were asked to serve, I was asked to serve on an advisory team that was put together by the State Department where we connected weekly in helping to manage the transition. Great, thank you. Just before we jump into discussion, a couple of ground rules. When we first had our call to convene and get this group together, they were being so nice to one another. And I thought, well, school closure is, is it fun in Missouri? Or like, what's going on? <laughs> and you know, I would say that this group of people was just so respectful that this is hard work, that it wasn't personal, that there, weren't, um, finger, there wasn't a lot of finger pointing in, in, in how they were describing the St. Louis situation. And so what I said to them is, well, I don't need you to be kumbaya today. I need you to reveal the warts in a way that is productive, that isn't finger pointing. And so this today isn't about that, and I want to just reiterate that for the audience. This is really they're sharing their experiences, their lessons learned, learn and really hopefully that we hope that you all will leave today realizing that you can do this that um, we can hold ourselves to a higher standard so with that I'm going to um, ask Doug to reveal the warts lay out lay, outline the landscape for us give a, set the stage for the group so the there were plenty of warts and <laughs> uh, in St. Louis uh, at the time we were going through again this crisis of quality we, we were having a very difficult time finding sponsors who would, were willing to entertain new charter schools because of the quality of not only these schools, but some of the others as well. Uh, philanthropic funders were pulling their money out of St. Louis, and the reasons that they were stating for pulling those dollars had to do with the quality of the existing schools as well as the quality of applications that were coming in. Uh, we were in a, a time when uh, the media was, was scrutinizing what was happening with the charter schools. And as is true in so many places around the country, a black eye for one charter school is a black eye for the whole sector. And so there, there were just so many reasons that we had to address what happened with quality and what was going on. Uh, the other piece was that the sponsor, the authorizer of, this school, of these schools, Missouri Baptist, uh, was in a really difficult point where sponsorship had never been defined in the state of Missouri. And so there was just no definition of what is it we are supposed to do. Uh, we had spent some time with NAXA trying to work with sponsors on understanding their role and helping them to, to build the processes that ne they needed for monitoring and oversight. Um, and Missouri Baptist had tried to put some, some of those things in place, but unfortunately, it was an example of, by the time they had the procedures in place, the, the horse was already out of the barn and halfway around the track, and they just couldn't get it back. They couldn't pull enough data. They couldn't get enough documentation. Uh, they couldn't build enough relationship with the governing boards to really insist and create a difference. And, and so, in the end, Missouri Baptist ended up losing their ability and their authority to sponsor schools. Um, so the short version of this is that after all of these pieces had happened, 
uh, Mayor Slay, in the city of St. Louis, who has been such a huge proponent of charter schools, uh, came forward publicly and said, these six schools, 3,800 students, 400 staff, I support charter schools, but I support quality. These six schools have to close and called for their closure. Uh, at that point, Missouri Baptists started to realize that this was, they, you know, they were fearful of lawsuits, they were fearful of uh, bad press, and they were fearful of the, the implications on the, their university, which you know, charter schools isn't their main role in life. Um, and so they started to really rethink, do we really want to do this? And at the same time, the state association, we came forward and said, the mayor's right. You know, these schools are really poor and they're not doing the job meeting the needs of these children who have already been underserved for years. And we can't allow that to happen. And so we supported the mayor in that. Uh, interesting spot to be in when you're supporting the closure of schools that are members of your association. Uh, from that point, then decisions had to be made at the Department of Education by the State Board of Education. And so the commissioner came forward and called for the closure of the schools as well. And at that point, there had been so much happening with communication between stakeholders, the business community, the, the neighborhood groups, uh, the political leaders, ourselves, national organizations. We were all by then on the same page through those, those conversations that just seemed to take years in building momentum that when the closures were, it was time for those to happen, the management group that was fighting this really found out they just had nowhere to turn and they had to respect that these schools were going to close and we were gonna find new seats in quality schools for these 3,800 kids. Great, let me just ask a follow-up. Can you talk about quality? What, what was the quality of these schools and how long had they been open? Uh, these schools had been open let's say four, five, four, four or five years. Uh, these schools were underperforming from the get-go. Um, you know, those first years you're saying, let's give these schools a chance, let's give these schools a, a chance to, to improve. Um, just some snapshots, of, a glimpse of these schools. We had one of these was a high school. Uh, the year before the school closed, this high school had 75 911 calls in one school year to the high school. Mm -hmm. There were real safety concerns. Mm -hmm. uh, the performance, the academic performance, was coming in at 4% uh, proficient or satisfactory. Um, the, the governing boards were down to two, maybe three members, and there was no such thing as a quorum. Mm -hmm. There was no such thing as, as a, a public meeting. Um, the teachers were continually reaching out to sponsors, reaching out to the department, reaching out to the association, reaching out to the mayor's office saying, yep. when you come in, you're not seeing what's really happening mm -hmm. and, and talking about the conditions and the lack of resources. So there were a lot of concerns there, along with the, the larger concerns, not necessarily more important, about the amount of money that was being spent on facilities and on paying back loans to the management company that was resulting in close to 25%, if not more, of the students per pupil going back to a management company as opposed to going towards the classroom. Great, thanks. So with 4% proficiency and 75 uh, calls to the police department, I guess, over a year, Robin, talk to us about why the mayor is, took, took this bold step of initiating closure of six schools. Uh, it, it was a bold step, but it was something that took uh, several years to lay out. I think Doug did a great job of sort of giving you the landscape, and so let me hit three themes that I think uh, were important for our office and the role that the mayor played. The first one was a champion. He had been a consistent champion of um, of quality and we had been attracting new schools to St. Louis and those new schools were not getting the attention. Actually, they were being harmed by the aggregate look at charter schools and so if we let these schools stay, we were fearful that the new schools that we had been developing would be sort of painted, with, they were being painted with the same brush. Um, so it was hard for us to convince donors and sponsors 
to stay in the game with us when these schools still were around. We were constantly asked, why are they still open? So um, that was the first one. The second is that um, we really were hearing parent complaints. So teachers were calling us, but we were really hearing from parents. And they were really having a difficult time. This was supposed to be a better school. Where were our choices? And so the mayor needed to be a voice for them as well. Secondly, um, I cannot stress enough the importance of communication. There's that adage, um, prior, uh, proper prior planning prevents poor performance. <laughs> and that really was what this took. It took years of laying the groundwork. Uh, there, I went to board meetings to find that there was no quorum. I called the sponsor from the school and said, I'm here for a board meeting. There aren't, uh, there aren't members here. There were um, lack of financial instruments. There was um, the stories that were going on about the violence or concerns of safety. We would then contact the police department and request those calls. We would send them out to other individuals. So we constantly communicated what, um, what we were hearing, we really went and found the evidence, and then tied all of that evidence together as a story. And we began meeting with small groups of our supporters, of ed reformers in St. Louis, the business community, um, two of our large business group organizations have ed committees, and we showed them the data, the academic data, the financial data, and what was going on from a financial and um, um, governance standpoint, managerial standpoint. But I also spent an enormous amount of time educating our local reporter. Uh, we need to be able to, again, separate out what was going on about the development of our new schools from these existing schools. And we laid the groundwork over several years of showing the difference. And so I think it would have been very difficult for us to just launch this out one day through a press conference. It really was a steady development of information, and so our office was a trusted voice on making the distinction about what was good and what was not. Um, so the press conference really was a culminating event in a lot of ways for our office, not the first thing that we did. And so the mayor held um, first the press conference and then spent um, about a week doing one-on-ones with radio and television um, to get the story straight. And we did this timed with the release of four articles that the Post-Dispatch reporter was working on, on facilities, on academic performance. We actually delayed our press conference several times because we were waiting for the final word that this story was going to hit the daily. And that helped us build momentum. So I think being strategic about when you communicate is as important as what you communicate. And then finally, I think Doug alluded to it, being able to connect these conversations. We kept I think uh, an important role we played was keeping the group together. Doug was brand new. Um, Welcome to the job, Doug. We're going to go after some schools that are your members. Um, and because Doug and I had had a, a, a prior relationship, I think it helped. But I knew the difficult position he was going to be in. One of his board members was a leader at one of these schools. And so we talked about it ahead of time. I'm like, when's her term up? I think you need to coach her um, moving on so that he wasn't hit with an embarrassing moment. We really looked at that level of detail. And then we really relied on this organization um, to bring in uh, the experts. So William Heff came in um, at the request of our business community and laid out basically what was in that closure guide that built confidence in our business community that this was not going to be a hot mess in St. Louis and not going to be um, a, a big disaster. There were um, experienced people in this country that had done work like this that could be transferred to St. Louis. And then Greg had a conversation with our Commissioner of Education um, and really bolstered her confidence that she could do this, that she could take on uh, the role of a sponsor in an intermediary, uh, intermediate time and do something as bold as that needed to be done. So it was all of those pieces together that I think made St. Louis a success.